The water immersion revival, we know some people downplay it. It doesn't matter. We know what God's doing. This past week in North Georgia, they carried a lady from her wheelchair into the pool. Let me back up. The prayer time that week, the number of people in prayer was more than it ever had. There's power in numbers. When we collect together, we come together and pray, there's power. There's power in our individual prayer, but in numbers, there's even more power. There's even more strength. There's even more authority because we're together as one. In one accord, things happen. They carried the lady into the pool and she walked out. That's what God wants to do. That's what he is doing. And that's what we expect to see here by carrying the power. But it's going to come through prayer. It's going to come through corporate prayer. So anytime we're open up for corporate prayer, be there. Be there. Be there, please. So I met this guy around four years ago. Walked into this building, this room. There was people around the table. They were praying for revival. He'd been a pastor for 50 years, was pastoring at the time at Zion's Hill Baptist Church, loving on people there. And we connected and connected and connected. We get to meet. He feeds me, lets me hear the wisdom of his 50 years of experience. And so this morning, I can't even give you the, the, the list of the rap sheet that he has I call it rap sheet because it's just amazing. The rap sheet that he has in ministry, the miles that he has in ministry. So uh, will you stand this morning and welcome Brother Steve Brown as he comes and brings you your 4th of July message this morning. Hallelujah. something I ate. I, <laughs> well, good morning to um, all of you and good morning to all of you online. I hope you're enjoying the day with your families and uh, it is a wonderful weekend that, that God has given us. It really is. I can't tell you what an honor it is uh, to speak to this family of believers that I really have come to love. Um, I have followed, as Jason intimated, the birth and infancy of life of love from its very conception. And, and uh, I never will forget the day that Jason and Shelley uh, walked into the room four years ago. Uh, as he said, I was conducting a, um, a weekly prayer for revival we were having over there at the Old Elks Club where Churches and Mission is. And uh, Jason and Shelley walked in, and I asked them who they were, and they told me. And I said, what brought you here? And they said that they had heard about the prayer meeting this four years ago, and that God had led them to come to Martinsville to start a church. And from that moment in 2018 until this morning, I have been one of the biggest fans of Life of Love. I really have. And back then, back then, as Jason said, I was finishing out about a half century of uh, ministry and pastoring of local, uh, smaller local churches across the years. Uh, and I wasn't able to come here. I wasn't able to attend regularly. I was busy on Sunday morning. But uh, uh, now, uh, since I retired last August, uh, my wife Debbie and I have been able to come a whole lot more, and it's really good. Um, <laughs> 
But even though I wasn't able to come, I was like a helicopter, though. I sort of hovered over the place, and I would, t I would touch down for a few services now and then. And um, last Monday, Jason, Pastor Jason asked me to preach. And uh, I just want to say, Jason would agree with me. Any time you can speak on behalf of the Lord, it is such an honor. It is such a high responsibility that you feel when you do it. But for me, it is especially humbling uh, to speak to this house. Because first of all, without a doubt, there is something special going on here. There really is. Uh, I don't need to tell you that I, I love, I dearly love Jason and Shelley. And we've all heard their story of how they traded in an opportunity to minister in Florida to say yes to God for Martinsville. And you know, uh, the ramifications of that decision are just now, that yes, are just unfolding. And we're getting to see it happen for our eyes. Uh, you know, I've been praying, per what's the matter? Bring it up a little bit. Jason said it was a $10,000 microphone and don't mess, bend it. I, <laughs> I hope it's over. Um, but anyway, um, I've been, I'm a guy that's been praying for revival for a whole lot of years. I'm talking about a national revival, something that touches the culture. That's because I got a taste of it back in the late 60s and early 70s. And do you know there's no one of us alive that knows what revival really looks like. And the reason I say that, there have only, I'm talking about a revival that doesn't stay in a church. I'm talking one that penetrates the culture and there's completely trans, trans you know, there's just a transformation in activity and such and behavior. And there's only been about two of them that have been at, mainly identified, maybe three or four little bursts of national revival uh, in the history of these United States. One of them actually started before the country was born. And um, the last one was more than 100 years ago. So we just don't really know what it's going to look like. But I really feel like we may be on the precipice of something really wonderful. And that's why I'm such a big fan of LOL, because um, I've been around here for 21 years. That's not as long as, nearly as long as a lot of you have. But I'm familiar with the churches. I really am. Uh, I've been attending ministerial meetings for almost two decades. And I can say, without a doubt, there is no one, there is no one church that is more um, positioned uh, to host the presence of God and, and to experience a fresh outpouring of God's Holy Spirit than this place right here. No, I'm, I, I mean, you know, it's just a fact. I'm, it's not, I'm not, you know, it's just true. Uh, and, I, and I'm not going to go into all the reasons. So I really, I mean, think about three, and think about the three and a half. I've watched this thing. You've lived it. The three and a half year run of this church is remarkable. I, I can't think of a, a birth church that has experienced so much uh, so many miracles and, uh, you know, uh, freedoms, you know, liberations from addictions and things that have happened in this place. It's just been a move of God. But, you know, truthfully, the Holy Spirit is not just looking for an opportunity to visit. The Holy Spirit wants to set up a habitation. He wants to come and stay in place. And, you know, the power and breadth, the power and breadth of the outreach of this church um, is contingent. It's contingent. There's a lot of promise, but it depends upon the depth of our personal surrender and our obedience to the Lord. You know... Please mark this, the sum of any organization, I should say, the total of any organization 
is the sum of its parts, its members. And do you know, Jason and Shelley and a, and, and a core of sold out people are not enough to accomplish, it's just not enough to accomplish what God really dreams for this church. All hands must be on deck. It really must be if we are to accomplish our assignment. And time will tell. It just will tell. And may I say something rather bluntly? <laughs> many of us profess allegiance to Jesus. And many of us who do are pretty self-focused. And what I mean is, for many of us, Jesus is not... And may I just be honest and say, for, for, I, don't, I don't know, many might not be fair, but I will say for some of us, Jesus is not our all-consuming passion. He isn't. We attend church, we conduct our lives with character and integrity, but for a number of us, we are committed to the Lord on the basis of convenience. We are not ready to drop things at a heartbeat when the Lord speaks to us, when we get a nudge from the Holy Spirit and just go and be obedient. You know, I'm wearing one of my favorite t-shirts this morning. You can't read it, but here's what it says. It says, my world revolves around the sun, S-O-N. Like Jesus is the center, Jesus is the center of my universe. He is not simply one of the planets that revolve around me, do you see? He is the center, I am not. And this is what Jason was talking about during his sold out series. You know, years ago there was a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was a Lutheran pastor in Germany and was also a, a, a teacher in college. And just about a week and a half before Berlin was liberated, Hitler hanged Bonhoeffer on, on the cross, yeah, not on the cross, but on the gallows. And Bonhoeffer wrote this. When Jesus calls a man, he bids him to come and die. And by that he meant to come and die to their personal self-focused, self-centered plans. And for a true Christ follower, Jesus must be the center of our universe. And if we are perfectly honest, if we're perfectly honest, many of God's people, not just here, many of God's people would fit into the description that Paul gave to the Philippians in chapter 3 and verse 21 when he said, for everyone looks out for his own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. And if our church is to mature and answer God's call upon us, it's going to require a lot more death to self, dependence upon, and surrender to Jesus Christ. And so that is the crux of the message God gave me this morning. And today I'm going to give you the opportunity to make a declaration of dependence upon God. Now, this is the 4th of July weekend. The Declaration of Independence is the founding document of our nation. Some of us have been to see it at the National Archives. How many have gone? To, hold your hand up if you've been in Washington and walked up the steps and stood six feet in front of the Declaration of Independence. One that's a, one an experience to think about. 56 men placed their lives and their signatures on the line. And these 56 guys were from a diverse, just from all over the, 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 the road map, you might say. There were businessmen, there were teachers, there were college professors, 
a farmer or two, and yes, a few pastors. And it cost 14 of those men their lives. And several of them, their sons. And there's almost none of them were, that were not touched by a financial or a material loss of great measure. Freedom and liberty are strong Bible words. The scripture I just have right here is the one that's already been quoted. 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, or there is freedom. It depends on your translation, but it means the same. Freedom and liberty are strong Bible words. And independence is a good thing when we consider being free from the tyranny of another nation. But the Bible does, the Bible does not teach personal independence. It really does not. The Bible teaches freedom from the tyranny of sin through dependence on God and His Son, Jesus Christ. In Galatians 5, 1, it says, It is for freedom. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. <clears throat> and Paul said over in Romans 6, 18, he says, You have been set free from sin and have become servants or slaves to righteousness. Think about the miracle. Think about the change. Many of us could bear testimony to when we were just drawn and dragged into the things that we should not be doing. We were enslaved to sin. But now that that was B.C., before Christ, but now after Christ... We are drawn to righteousness. You know the feeling. Some of you could bear witness to testify that your draw, your, your draw and your, is much more to do or doing what's right now and not toward what's wrong. Could anybody say, hold their hand up and say they can feel that difference? That's nothing short of a miracle. That is real new birth and new life. Over in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 and 14, Paul said this, For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. But do not use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. We often forget, I think, that... Um, in declaring independence from the, from the earthly power, that would be Great Britain in this case, those great men of the revolution made a direct declaration. They, they signed a declaration of independence, but at the same time they made a declaration of dependence on God. At the closing lines of the document, Thomas Jefferson wrote these words, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. Did you hear that word? Reliance. Divine providence is God. With a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. My friends, that declaration of dependence was the womb in which this country was born. And that, uh, by the way, if you have any doubt of that, just get on, get on the internet and Google the quotes of our founders. I just read a, just, a, just, a bear, just a few. George Washington said, it is impossible, think about this, the first president of the United States. He said, it is impossible to rightly govern a nation without God in the Bible. That was the president of the United States. Andrew Jackson said, the Bible is the rock 
upon which this republic rests. And Thomas Jefferson, who became the third president of the United States and the author of the Declaration of Independence, he stated in a speech, the Bible is the cornerstone of freedom. Can the liberties of a nation be secure when we have removed a conviction that these liberties are the gift of God? Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. I don't need to tell you, my friends, that our nation's in a mess. We're in a mess. We're in a mess morally, spiritually, economically. And we, we, we absolutely have never been more divided politically and ideologically than we are in 2021. And I think Abraham Lincoln stated it well during the Civil War in 1863. He made a proclamation to declare a national day of prayer and fasting. And the following words I read right now, they are so relevant. They are so relevant to our nation right now. He wrote, whereas it is the duty of nations as well as of men to own their dependence upon the, to own their dependence upon the overruling power of God, to confess their sins and transgressions in humble sorrow. That was the text of the proclamation. You ought to compare that to the National Day proclamations made recently. He went on to say, listen to this, how current it is. We have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined that in the deceitfulness of our hearts, that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom or virtue of our own. And intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to the God that made us. And it behooves us then to humble ourselves before the offended power to confess our national sins and pray for clemency and forgiveness. Can you imagine a modern day president writing words like that? This was a national declaration of dependence upon God. And so as individuals and as a country, we will experience true freedom for our spirits, for our souls. Once we realize and acknowledge our inadequacy to do it ourselves, we need to make our own personal declaration of dependence on the God who loves us. And so I ask you, how about you? Have you ever done that? <laughs> Are you depending upon God for your next breath? Have you ever, once and for all, rested the entire weight of your confidence for forgiveness and life after death 
upon the precious blood of Jesus plus nothing? Or are you depending on your track record to have merit before God? The Bible says all have sinned and have fallen short. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 64, 6 of Isaiah says that all of our deeds, all of our good deeds are like filthy rags in his sight compared to his spotless holiness. So we need Jesus. We need his blood to cleanse us. And have you acknowledged that all of your times are in his hands? Have you declared your dependence upon God for his guidance and his provision for all of your future days? And along with your dependence, have you surrendered to his will? Jesus said, if a man loves me, he will obey what I command. John 14, 15. And so let us not forget that Jesus purchased us, purchased us by his blood. He had, Jesus, Jesus has a right to help himself to my life, to your life, to your time, to your resources for his purposes. If we are a Christ follower. He owns title deed. He owns title deed to your life and everything you are and everything you have. First Corinthians chapter six says this, flee from sexual or immorality. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside of his body. But whoever sins sexually, sins against their own body. And then he said, do you not know that your bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. And how do we glorify God with our bodies? Paul gave us a hint over there in the book of Romans in chapter 12, 1, when he said, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy and pleasing to God, which is your proper and true worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Most of the patriots who won independence in 1776 for us, had no trouble acknowledging their total dependence upon God, and neither should we. We are dependent on God for every breath and every opportunity, and we may as well admit it. I'm going to give all of us an opportunity to make a declaration of dependence. And may I ask you just to stand. I'd like to ask you to just read this. After me. Or not after me, with me. There we go. I declare my total unqualified dependence upon God my Father, Jesus my Savior, and the precious Holy Spirit. 
I confess that every breath I take and each beat of my heart is by God's permission alone. Everything I am and everything I own are nothing but gifts of grace from your hand, dear Father. I am totally dependent upon you for the ability to earn a living and provide for my family. Even my ability to think and speak and down from you. The blood of Jesus purchased me from the slave market of sin. My body is not even my own. It is now a temple of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, in total reliance and complete dependence upon God for life itself, I declare myself surrendered and sold out to his purposes alone. Dear Lord, I trust you and believe that you will meet all my needs as I depend upon you for everything. I love you with all of my heart, mind, soul, and strength. And I'll do my best to bring you honor and pleasure for your glory and my joy. Amen. Hallelujah. Maybe see, maybe see. Now the scene is 20 years ago. It's 1991 in Washington, D.C. It's the Washington Hilton. And there are 2,000 people gathered. 2,000 people gathered in the Grand Ballroom. There are politicians from all branches of government, corporate executives, and other leaders. And they're there for the annual National Leadership Luncheon. The Gulf War is now two weeks old. And under the glistening chandeliers, the main speaker comes to the podium. His name is Charles Stanley, pastor of First Baptist Church in Atlanta. And his text is James 5.16, which says, The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. He preaches eloquently and fervently about the need for America to humble itself before God. And without raising his voice, he speaks these words. He said, what would happen today if 2,000 people got on their knees, humbled themselves before God, and cried out for forgiveness. He then said, kneeling is a good thing. It reminds us who the master is and who the servant is. And gradually, the crowd realizes he is serious. He is talking about them getting on their knees in their expensive clothes. He also said that there will be people here that are not physically able to kneel for a number of reasons. But to the rest, he says, I want to ask you if you will join me on my knees and pray until whenever the moderator thinks the time is over. And with that, he turns, drops from sight, end of sermon. And you know what? The ballroom was silent. You could hear a pin drop. And there's a gradual shuffle of, chair, of chairs. And before long, most of the crowd followed his lead. Now, I want to ask you to do something as we close here. Some of you can't because you're not able to physically, and that's fine. But I'd like to ask the rest of us to just spend a few moments in prayer 
and I'm going to ask you to find a way to kneel. You can do it in front of right there where you're sitting. You can come up here and use this altar, but there's not enough room for all of us. But I just want you to kneel and pray. I want you to pray as you see fit. I want you to ask the Lord to accept your surrender afresh. I want you to possibly pray for your own repentance. God sometimes may have us his finger on a spot or two in your own heart where you know you need to repent and be sorry and change. And so do that if that's how God leads you. Pray for this church, would you? I pray for it all the time. Would you pray for this church right here to become all that she is meant to be in God's heart? That's it. Let's get to work just for a few minutes. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for revealing those wounded places in our hearts, those places of need that God, only you can fill. Thank you for the forgiveness that brings freedom to our lives. Thank you for your love. out all fear. The love that changes lives. The love that chastises and draws us closer to relationship, to intimacy with you, Father. Help us to become a people that will humble ourselves and pray and worship the God of creation, the God of glory.
worship the God that dreamed of us before the foundations of the earth to be amazing sons and daughters. For where the Spirit of the Lord is, truly there is freedom. 